On a January evening in 2000, a short flight between two large African cities goes horribly wrong quickly after takeoff. An Airbus A310 carrying 179 passengers and crew would crash into the Atlantic Ocean just moments after takeoff from Abidjan. The time from between the plane leaving the runway to crashing into the ocean was less than one minute. The crash of Kenya Airways Flight 431 would become the deadliest incident to involve this plane, the A310. Just what happened on the flight deck of this airplane? The answer to this mystery would be found in a potential electrical fault in one of the plane's warning systems, which led the pilots to believe they were in a situation they actually weren't. Based out of Nairobi, Kenya, Kenya Airways is considered to be one of the best airlines on the African continent. The city of over 10 million people is connected by the country's national airline to destinations all across the world. The airline, along with its competitor in neighboring Ethiopia, also has an extensive African network linking Nairobi to the continent's other large cities. In the year 2000, Kenya Airways had operated the two variants of the Airbus A310, the 200 and 300. In their time of operation, they had three 300s in their fleet. Five Yankee Bravo Echo November being the accident plane of Flight 431, the Airbus A310 is a shorter, stubbier version of the Airbus A300, more specifically, the A300-600. With more technological upgrades to the plane's systems and fuel capacity, this plane could fly further than the A300 ever could, albeit with fewer passengers. Flight 431 was the return flight back to Nairobi from Abidjan in the Ivory Coast. The outbound flight was supposed to make a stopover in Lagos, Nigeria, but due to poor weather, the plane could not land. The flight continued to Abidjan without the stopover. When the plane landed in Abidjan, there were still many passengers who needed to get to Lagos, so the stopover would now be made on the return flight to Nairobi. The plane landed in Abidjan at 3.15 in the afternoon on January 30, 2000. The flight would be delayed due to the unfavorable weather conditions at Lagos for several hours. The poor weather in question, however, was reported to not be rain, but rather an unusually heavy haze, which was caused by seasonal winds blowing from the Sahara. In the time that the flight was delayed, there was a change of crew. The two pilots taking over for the accident flight included 44-year-old Captain Paul Muthi, an experienced pilot on the Airbus A310. Muthi also had extensive experience flying several other planes. He had just over 11,500 total flying hours. On this flight, he was to be the one handling the radio communication. 43-year-old First Officer Lazaro Matumbi Mully was more experienced on this aircraft than their captain. With over 7,000 total flight hours logged, he was the one handling the flight controls on this flight. Night had fallen as the new scheduled departure time of Flight 431 was now 9pm. In the minutes preceding 9pm, clearance was received from air traffic control and the pilots began performing the before start checklists. At 9pm, the plane's two engines were started up on time, where taxi instructions were given one minute later. Flight 431 would taxi out to runway 21 for a departure to the south. The airport delays just meters from the coastline and so the flight would head out over this section of the Atlantic Ocean immediately after takeoff. The final before takeoff checklists were complete, and Flight 431 received clearance for takeoff at 9.08. The takeoff roll would appear to be normal. As routine, the flight crew made the appropriate callouts with effective communication. At 9.08 and 50 seconds in the evening, the plane left the runway. What would happen in the next few seconds would severely confuse the pilots, especially the co-pilot, the one flying the plane. So we need to break down what happened moment by moment. Seven seconds after the plane reached takeoff speed, the standard callout for a positive rate of climb and the landing gear up command was noted on the cockpit voice recorder. Two seconds later at 9.08 and 59 seconds, the A310 stall warning sounded on the flight deck. As to why the stall alert system activated is up for debate. The investigation by the BEA in France concluded that this was in fact a false alarm of an undetermined source. There were some possibilities explored to explain this false alarm, 
of which all of the following were ruled out. These scenarios included incorrect takeoff configuration of the plane, meaning the flaps and slats were incorrectly deployed, display of incorrect indicated air and ground speed, loss of engine power, uncommanded retraction of the flaps and slats, sudden change of center of gravity from the movement of cargo, uncommanded deployment of the reverse thrust, and uncommanded deployment of the spoilers on the wings. All of these poised scenarios were not the cause of the false stall warning, so what did cause it to activate? The investigation, according to the accident report, suggests that the possible cause may be linked to how the plane calculates its performance data. Quote, it could be generated by an anomaly in the plane's speed calculations. For example, an anomaly in one of the angle of attack sensors or in the stall generation system. The plane is constantly taking measurements to perform its performance calculations. It may have been possible that a piece of information perhaps relating to airspeed may have been erroneous, and that information was relayed to the stall alert system which prompted it to sound. Regardless, this could not be conclusively proven. The pilots were taught to treat any instance of this alert as a threat, especially at low altitude. The Airbus A310 at this point was just mere hundreds of feet from the ground, having only just took off. The severity of this alarm had led to the co-pilot instinctively pushing forward on their control column to initiate what they would have felt as a necessary stall recovery maneuver. The plane was not in a stall, it was a false alarm, but as with any alerts, the pilots treated it as a real threat. The flight crew operating manual which the flight crew were familiar with, issued by Airbus, did not include the procedure of how to manage a stall scenario in the initial climb phase of flight. However, what was noted in that manual, and subsequently what the flight crew were taught to do, was to act immediately. It did not help the flight crew that this occurred at night, at an airport located next to an ocean. Because of the southerly departure over the ocean, if they were doubting their instruments, they would not have had any visual reference of an actual horizon or visual ground contact to verify what was happening to their plane. Kenya Airways Flight 431 never climbed above 400 feet before the plane started descending. The pilot flying did not apply maximum thrust where they should have, if believing the alert was true. The investigation would look closer at this pilot's actions, and determined that there should have been enough information for him on the aircraft's instruments to determine that this was a false alarm. Due to a hierarchy of importance in the aircraft's alert systems, the stall warning took precedence over the ground proximity warning system, which was mostly absent on the cockpit voice recording, aside from the initial distinctive whooping sound effect. The rest of the alert was masked by the stall warning and an overspeed warning. Less than 25 seconds after the plane left the runway, the captain, the pilot not flying, asked what problem his co-pilot was experiencing. The aircraft's audible radio altimeter callouts had begun to sound, indicating the plane was going down and approaching the water. In response to the captain, co-pilot Mully asked for the audio warnings to be manually cut at 9.09 and 18 seconds. The radio altimeter callouts are a series of altitudes the plane would make to the pilots. It's normally helpful on landing as the flight crew can direct more attention to landing their aircraft instead of looking at their instruments. It's not something that should be heard just after takeoff. In this scenario, the plane called out 300, 200, 100, 50, 30, and 20 feet callouts in succession. At 9.09 .09 and 20 seconds, Flight 431 entered its final seconds of the flight. The pilot flying had begun pulling back on the control column, however, up till impact, the plane would be in a negative vertical speed. At 22 seconds, the captain announced, go up. Less than a second later, the 10 feet callout was heard. Two seconds later, at 9.09 .09 and 24 seconds, Kenya Airways Flight 431 crashed into the Atlantic Ocean, killing 169 people. As with other plane crashes in water, the plane was completely destroyed and obliterated. Incredibly, there were survivors. Twelve people survived the initial crash in the Atlantic Ocean. The survivors were seated in all various parts of the plane. Most were pulled from the water after more than an hour had passed since the plane had went missing. One passenger, a French national, had actually swam to the shore 
a distance of around two kilometers. Two survivors later died in hospital. One surviving passenger, Emmanuel Madu, made a YouTube video in 2013 detailing their experience. The link to that video will be in this video's description. In the aftermath, it was recommended that aviation authorities include a training scenario for an initial climb and or low altitude stall alert in their flight training on all types of aircraft. Kenya Airways would reevaluate its flight training also. The airline would also later retire the Airbus A310. In fact, the plane has largely been retired across the world and now remains in limited service with only a few carriers. Hello everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I know this video was a bit on the shorter side compared to other recently released videos. I have now thankfully recovered from whatever it was I had last week and when I recorded the narration for this video, so apologies if again if I sounded a bit off. Regardless, if you did find this video interesting, be sure to subscribe and ring the bell as there is a new video every Saturday. I am hoping to try out YouTube's premiere feature soon. If I haven't managed to do it for this video, then maybe a video very soon I'll be trying it out. So keep an eye out for that when that happens. Anyway, I must take the opportunity to thank my patrons for their incredible support. We are just about to hit 50 patrons, and I can't thank you all enough for the generous support you have given over these past months. If you would like to get your name featured here or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Disaster Breakdown Patreon from £3 per month and get early access on all new videos two days before they go out publicly. So a thank you to my £5 tier patrons, Aaron Wilson, Hector Palmatellas, Jugis, Ken Zachman, Kevin Connors, Christy, Leon St. Jennings, Marie Ennis, MG, Pacman 7, Panic Chicken, Rebecca Rivers, Sophia Melody, So FP, and Sue So Sue Shoes. A massive thanks to my incredibly generous £10 tier patrons, Aidan Montgomery, Alex, Alex Keller, Anne Sid, Daniel Hendricks, Derek Bean, Joey Berkey, Karma, who was a new joiner, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Roger Mayer, and Where Are My Cheetos. Thank you all so much. And that is it for me today. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.